Marines who were dirty and tired didn't seem to care much about the orders their boss yelled. He told them to make yet another charge to the top of the plain hill that was in their way. This hill was home to another enemy who was trying to stop their progress. But his words had a different meaning, a tone that made the men feel things they thought had been buried. Some of us will never come down again after we go up there, the cop growled. That hill has to be taken, and we're going to do it. You all know what hell it is up there. I'm going to the top of Sugar Loaf Hill. Who wants to join? After giving that short speech, Major Henry A. Courtney, Jr. led 44 Marines in a brave charge that helped make the name Sugar Loaf become linked to bravery, death, and honor. W2 History Magazine has monthly articles about the Pacific Theater and the battles that shaped the Second World War. What led up to the Okinawa Campaign six weeks earlier, the Okinawa Campaign started with peace and quiet, which was very different from what Courtney's unit would soon face with violence. Marine Colonel Earl Landreth, who was with the attack Marines as an observer on April 1st, 1945, when they landed on Okinawa's beaches, was shocked by how few enemies there were. Landreth was carefully writing down notes in his small black covered notebook as his boat sped closer to shore. He was amazed that the enemy mortar shells and hail of machine gun bullets that he thought would be quickly turning the usually calm waters into a cauldron of death were not there. Landreth and the other Marines in his landing craft instead found silence. The landing site was chosen because it was on Okinawa's western coast, close to the town of Higushi. The wide beach and gentle waves made it a good entrance and the gradually rising land behind Higushi led to two important airfields a mile behind the beaches. The Marines were ready for a harsh welcome on the beach, like the horrible show at Bloody Tarawa 17 months before. They would have to fight their way all the way to the beach. It was put on the line for a group of Marine privates and corporals from the 1st Marine Division at Ulithi. A soldier named PFC Eugene B. Sledge wrote one of the most famous war memoirs. He remembered what the officer told the small group. This is likely to be the most expensive amphibious campaign of the war. Since we're going to attack an island about 350 miles from where the Japanese live, you can expect them to fight harder than ever. 80 to 500% of those who go to the beach will die. The other young Marines and Sledge sat there in stunned silence as if they were reading their own death notices. They were told that was what they should expect because no operation had ever taken such a terrible toll on its attacking waves before. To lower that horrifying death toll estimate, a huge bombardment of Okinawa began on March 24th and continued for a week, hitting Japanese positions with more than 27,000 rounds of 5-inch or bigger shells. The constant bombing made enemy troops tense and kept them from sleeping. One angry Japanese soldier wrote in his diary, What the hell kind of jerks are they? You don't run out? Even though they were hit hard, the Japanese lost few soldiers and few posts were destroyed. The bombardment was only one part of the huge machine that was put together for the campaign. It was the first time that ground troops from Admiral Chester W. Nimitz's Central Pacific Drive and General Douglas MacArthur's Southwest Pacific Thrust worked together. The 10th Army, which was given the order to take Okinawa, had more than 180,000 soldiers. Lieutenant General Simon Bolivar Buckner was in charge of seven divisions. Four were Army divisions led by Major General John Hodge, and the 1st, 2nd, and 6th Marine divisions were led by Major General Roy S. Geiger. Okinawa was important to the U.S. for three reasons. To begin, American bombs with a medium range could hit the Japanese home islands from Okinawa, which was only 360 miles southwest of Kyushu. Second, military leaders needed the island as a base of operations for the invasion of the home islands that was set to happen in November. Lastly, taking Okinawa would cut off all supply lines from the resource-rich southwest to Japan, which is short on resources. The calm leadership of Mitsuru Ushijim. 
more than 100,000 soldiers from the 32nd Army and their inspiring leader, Lieutenant General Mitsuru Ushijima, fought hard against the Marines and Army infantry. Ushijima did not fit many of the common stereotypes about Japanese leaders that were popular in America during the war. Ushijima had a good military career before he came to Okinawa. He led an infantry unit in Burma and was in charge of the Japanese Military Academy at Zama. He was thoughtful and quiet. With the pride of an old samurai fighter, the skinny man with the big mustache bore himself. His reputation for being brave in battle and his caring personality made the people who worked for him not only trust him, but often love him. He talked to young soldiers and thanked volunteers who helped build defenses. Even though he gave his staff a lot of responsibility, he took the blame whenever something went wrong. Almost immediately before the Americans rushed ashore, Ushijima gave his troops some sensible advice. He did this in a way that was more like a kind teacher talking to his most important student. You need to understand that in this war, material power usually wins over spiritual power. The Americans clearly have better weapons than us. Do not count on your mental strength to help you beat this enemy. Come up with mathematically accurate ways to fight and then think about showing off your spiritual power. A lot of planners, including Ushijima, were sure that the Americans would take Okinawa. But if the Japanese could make their enemy fight for a long time, they might be able to put off the eventual invasion of the Japanese home islands until peace talks worked or a miracle happened and saved Japan. Plan to protect Okinawa by Ushijima Ushijima knew that his men would fight for every inch of land because once Okinawa fell, there wouldn't be much left to keep the U.S. from coming close to Japan. Ushijima was right when he figured out that he couldn't stop the Americans on Okinawa's beaches or in the north, where the land is mostly flat and where American tanks and planes could do a lot of damage. He chose to make his stand in the south instead, where the hills would help him and where he could use the port of Naha, Nakagusuku Bay, the big city of Shuri, and important airfields. Ushijima planned to let American troops land without being harmed and move inland. He then planned to wait until the American troops turned south. He planned to kill the enemy there on his terms and on ground that would work better for his troops. The southern third of Okinawa is mostly made up of hills, draws, cliffs, and limestone caves, while the northern third is mostly flat. The land is hilly and runs straight across the island from east to west. It forms a complex of natural defense lines that can be seen in many rings. There are hills and ridges that rise up to 300 feet above dirt roads that wind through valleys. When American units crossed these routes, they were perfect places for Ushijima's troops and artillery to kill them. Ushijima set up three horizontal defense lines on top of the old Shuri Castle. This castle, which was on top of a hill, watched over a six mile wide opening into southern Okinawa. The castle had two sides. The western side went through the hills to Naha and the sea, and the eastern side went to the Yonabaru airfield near the ocean. Underground rooms, caves, and emplacements were linked by complex tube systems. Okinawan burial vaults above ground gave Ushijima a lot of small castles he could use to fight the Americans. Ushijima wanted to wear out the Americans by making them attack every hill and search every cave and tomb. In front of the ridges, there were protective bunkers full of soldiers carrying machine guns and knee mortars. Behind the ridges, heavy machine gun positions added their deadly fire. More damage could be done with mortars put on the slopes and on top of the hills as well as artillery fire directed from hills nearby. Ushijima would move the units in the first line of defense to a second line when they could no longer hold on. There, the Americans would have to do the same expensive operations to get rid of the enemy. Ushijima wanted to separate the American troops from the tanks that were supporting them. He planned to do this by firing heavy artillery at the tanks and then sending Japanese soldiers with satchel charges and burning rags to make suicide runs toward the tanks. As American tank crews got out of their burning vehicles, other troops would shoot or bayonet them. Then, 
hundreds of caves and gun positions would open fire on the exposed American troops, killing them all. Two crack divisions with 24,000 soldiers each from the 62nd and 24th divisions were sent to the front lines of defense. They were joined by the 44th Independent Mixed Brigade, a tank unit, 15,000 sailors, and 20,000 members of the Boy Tai, the Okinawan Home Guard. There were also 3,500 men stationed on the Oroku Peninsula, led by Vice Admiral Minoru Ota, just behind the Shuri Line. They could help Ushijima. Okinawa could fall, but it would cost a lot, which would make the U.S. think twice about taking over land that the Japanese control. Sugarloaf Hill, the end of good luck. As the Army and Marines got ready to attack on April 1st, they didn't know this. The attack happening on April Fool's Day was called a coincidence by some. Some people thought it was funny that it was also Easter Sunday, which is a Christian holiday marked around the world as a day of peace and forgiveness. Before the attack, 42 ships and almost 200 gunboats rained huge shells on the area right behind Higuchi's beaches and 500 naval aircraft flew all over the landing zones, making them very noisy. After that terrible prelude, the Army's 7th and 96th Divisions hit the southern part of the beaches, while the 1st and 6th Marines hit the northern edges. Private First Class Eugene Sledge thought that the lack of resistance meant something bad. If there were a lot of Japanese people on Okinawa, where were they? They were going to get back at them one way or another. If they landed without being fought, it would only lead to intense fighting somewhere else at a later time. But for a while, Marines were glad they were still living. As units moved inland toward their first goals, their luck kept holding. This is hard to believe, wrote Robert Sherrod, the Pacific reporter for Time magazine. Sherrod had written about the Marine landings on Tarawa, Saipan, and Iwo Jima. Vice Admiral Richmond Kelly Turner, who was in charge of the amphibious forces at Okinawa, radioed Admiral Chester W.W. W. Nimitz at Pearl Harbor and said, I may be crazy, but it looks like the Japanese have quit the war, at least in this sector. Nimitz, who was more sober, replied, delete all after crazy. By the time night fell, 60,000 men with tanks, guns, and supplies had dug in on a beachhead that was 5,000 yards wide and 15,000 yards deep. The next day, when parts of the 1st Marine Division got closer to Okinawa's eastern coast, the smooth drive across Ishikawa Isthmus continued. The next day, Marines sealed the coast, cutting Ushijima's main group in the south off from his men in the north of Okinawa. What was supposed to take three weeks was taken over by American troops in just four days of fast progress. I've already lived longer than I thought I would, said a 7th Division infantryman who had been released. Marines built what they thought were life's comforts, mess halls, showers, and an outdoor movie screen because the battle was surprisingly easy. Yin General Buckner told the three army divisions to look for the enemy in the south while the 1st and 6th Marines were sent north. Sledge was right, though. The Marines' good luck had to end at some point. It came to a sudden stop at Sugarloaf Hill, a small hill with a name that sounds like something from a fairy tale. The Marines meet the Japanese. While the Marines found and attacked the enemy on the Motobu Peninsula in the north, the army troops stuck in front of Ushijima's first of three defense lines in the Shuri area. When the Marines' job was over, Buckner sent them south to help break through the Shuri line. When the 6th Marine Division moved into position, it fought against Ushijima's western seaward side. On the eastern flank, the 1st Infantry Division helped the tired 27th Infantry Division. Buckner had split the island into two battle zones. The army was in the eastern half, and the marines were in the western half. When they saw each other, they knew they were about to start a costly battle on Okinawa's rough ridges. Japanese commanders talked about what to do next while marines moved into place along the Shuri line. 
after a terrible Japanese counterattack on May 3rd, Ushijima had to move his troops to the second of his defense lines. This was an eight mile path that went from Yonabaru on the east coast to the port of Naha on the western coast of Okinawa, going through rough ridges near Shuri Castle. The land along this line had wrong names that made it sound like it belonged in a theme park. Ushijima's second line was dominated by Chocolate Drop Hill, Zebra Hill, Sugar Hill, Wart Hill, and Sugarloaf Hill. However, the rough terrain, which was covered in hundreds of Japanese machine guns and mortars, soon put Marines and Army soldiers to the test of their bravery, and the names of the hills, which were originally childlike, became words that meant death, pain, and terror. Nimitz had asked Buckner to speed up the ground operation so that his ships could leave the dangerous seas off Okinawa faster. This is one reason why Buckner planned to send 85,000 men in five divisions against this line. The 96th Infantry Division tried to go around Ushijima's eastern side at Yonabaru, and the 6th Marine Division sank into Naha. In the middle, the 77th Infantry Division of the Army and the 1st Marine Division moved towards Shuri Castle. Units that turned to the left or right were told to run across Okinawa and trap Ushijima's men. Buckner's troops attacked the castle walls at Sugarloaf Hill. At 7 a.m. on May 11th, Buckner's general attack began. The 3rd Battalion took high ground near the uh, Asado River that gave them a view of Naha. Marines turned south and east toward the rocky area between Naha and Shuri, to try to surround Ushijima's defense system and delay an attack on the town for a while. The smart Japanese leader had planned for this kind of move and put the fortifications at Sugarloaf Hill right in front of the 6th Marine Division as a surprise. As the 6th Division Marines got closer to their goal, Sugarloaf, many of them, thought how something so ordinary could cause such trouble, Shuri Heights, which rose sharply just a few hundred yards behind them seemed to dwarf what most Marines thought of as a small problem. Before the division closed in on Ushijima's main stronghold at Shuri Castle, there might only be time for a short action. The clay rise didn't really make people scared. Sugarloaf's 300 yards of frontage rose to only about 75 feet before leveling off into a thin crest. There were few shrubs and trees along the shoreline but 2,000 Japanese defenders were waiting calmly with hundreds of machine guns, mortars, grenades, and satchel charges to kill anyone who came near the small hill, which was the western end of Ushijima's main defense line and watched over both Naha and Shuri. Along with Horseshoe Hill to the south and Half Moon Hill to the southeast, Sugar Loaf formed the point of Shuri's deadly arrow thrust straight at the coming Marines the Marines would have to move across flat ground before they could even step foot on one of the slopes. To stop his enemy from moving on the flat ground and slopes, Ushijima manned the three hills with new soldiers from the 15th Independent Regiment of the 44th Brigade, which was led by Colonel Seiko Mita. He also turned the hills into complexes with many tunnels and machine gun and mortar nests. In order to protect his base, the Japanese leader made it so that if the Americans attacked any one spot, artillery from Shuri Heights and fire from all three hills would hit them hard. Every inch of Sugarloaf had been marked and griddled and every possible route had been taken. When the enemy was seen, the sound of shooting from the sleepy hill would wake up platoons and companies that weren't expecting it. It wasn't long before Sugarloaf left its mark on the fighters. Marines were worn out and confused after a week of fighting on Sugarloaf. Marines moved up the hill's slopes or even rushed to Sugarloaf's peak, but were met with fierce resistance that made them fall back. Their numbers were being cut down with every step. Fifty men could make it to the top of the slope, but fifteen would crash back down, hurt and confused. Company G gets to the top and then falls back. On May 12th in the afternoon, Captain Owen T. Stebbins led Company G of the 22nd Regiment's 2nd Battalion in an infantry tank attack that began seven days of pain. 
Company G was sure that the action would go quickly, so they didn't see much gunfire in the first 900 yards. When small arms, machine guns, mortars, and artillery started firing at them, all hell broke loose. Two of the three platoons were pinned down before they even got to Sugarloaf Slopes. Captain Stebbins and Lieutenant Dale W. Bear led the last 40 Marines from the platoon toward the hill, but 28 of them were killed by Japanese fire before they got 100 yards. Stebbins fell down when machine gun bullets hit his legs. Bear took charge, but Japanese fire tore off his left arm before he could give his first order. Bear got 25 Marines together and started attacking again after getting a light machine gun with his good hand. The hanging limb was no longer useful. When he and his 10 men got to the top of Sugarloaf, the 6 foot 2 inch, 225 pound officer stood tall and fired his machine gun at the enemy. The fact that Bear had no fear of danger made his men angry. It was impossible to be afraid when you saw him standing there, said one Marine. Sergeant Edmund DeMar said Bear looked like an actor from one of those famous war movies where a brave soldier fights off a group of enemies by himself. What a sight he was, standing on top of Sugarloaf by himself. There were two more shots that hit Bear before he fell. One tore a piece of his leg meat off and the other tore off some of his buttocks. DeMar was bleeding heavily from a wound in his thigh and could only see dead or hurt Marines around him. Even with all the noise and death, DeMar could not get rid of one sound. A young Marine who was hurt and scared cried out for his parents. Fewer and fewer people who were still alive on the hot peak knew they had to leave Sugarloaf or die. Marines began to crawl down the slopes toward their lines while hiding behind a smokescreen. He called the situation on Sugarloaf a screwed up mess, and he told another Marine who was worried about him that he would crawl all the way to Madison, Connecticut if I have to. After a short distance, a tank driver picked DeMar up and put a patch on the wound while he was on top of his vehicle. But he too was hit by enemy fire and fell asleep next to DeMar. As the tank slowly made its way down the rough, smoke-filled hills, the driver's hurt body started to drip on DeMar. What a thrill, DeMar warned. A lot of blood was on me from my leg wound and a huge amount from the tanker. It must have looked like a scene from a scary movie. During May 12th, Company G frequently attacked Sugarloaf and even took over the mountain's peak three times, but Japanese mortars and hand grenades pushed them back each time. When it got dark, the Japanese still controlled the hill while Marines took care of their injured. Half of the men in DeMar's platoon were killed, but only 75 of the 215 men in Company G were able to stay at their places that night. The most discouraging thing was that, despite the terrible deaths, the Marines would be attacked again in the days to come. Because Sugarloaf had to be taken, more young Americans had to die. Over the next six days, Marines did the same horrible thing over and over again. On May 13th, some members of the 22nd Regiment again made it to the top of Sugarloaf, but powerful Japanese counterattacks and gunfire from Shuri Heights pushed them back. What Courtney did tomorrow, both the 22nd and 29th Regiments will attack the hill. By early afternoon, two groups of Marines had reached the top but heavy enfilade fire drove them back down. The leader of the 2nd Battalion, Lieutenant Colonel Horatio C. Woodhouse, Jr., directed an attack in the late afternoon that got stuck on Sugarloaf Slopes, leaving 44 Marines stranded, while more than 100 other Marines were killed or hurt by heavy gunfire. Japanese troops threw hand grenades from the top of Sugarloaf at the Marines below. The executive officer of the 2nd Battalion, Major Henry A. Courtney, Jr., inspired the small group of attackers with powerful words and brave actions. Courtney and his men were angry that they were stuck on Sugarloaf Slope. He thought that they were in one of those desperate battle situations where they couldn't defend themselves and might as well attack. Men, Courtney said, if we don't take the top of this hill tonight, the Japanese will be down here in the morning to drive us away. He went on to say that when they got to the top, 
He wanted each man to throw as many hand grenades as they could at the enemy to pin them down and then uh, uh, stay put for a long time. After calling for mortar help over the radio, Courtney asked for helpers to go with him. Courtney began with 44 Marines and threw grenades into holes as he ran. Once they were at the top, Courtney's group started what they knew would be a bloody fight at night to take over Sugarloaf. In the dark, enemy troops crept so close to Courtney's makeshift perimeter that Marines could hear them grunt as they threw grenades at them. Around midnight, Courtney saw movement on the side held by Japan, which made him think of a possible Banzai charge. Before the enemy could attack, Courtney quickly got his men together and began an early attack over Sugarloaf's Peak. In less tense situations and safer places, this risky move might have been seen as silly, but on Sugarloaf, men took risks they would never normally think about. After the attack, a Marine who saw it said, oh, I think he, Courtney, might have gone a little crazy, but you know what? That happens. Watching so many of your friends get shot up so badly seems like it would take forever to take over a place like Sugarloaf. Then you decide to do something you normally wouldn't. The brave leader Courtney was killed when a hand bomb went off near him while he and his ragged group were pushing the Japanese back. Marines were upset about losing their leader, so they put a poncho over Courtney's body and kept fighting to hold their position. But as the long night went on, mortars and sniper fire cut the number of strong Marines down to 15. Sadly, they gave way to Sugarloaf's crest again the next morning. A counterattack leads to fighting with your hands. At 7.30 a.m. on May 15th, the Japanese launched a counterattack that pushed the few Marines still on Sugarloaf off of it and into Marine lines at the base of the hill, where the 2nd Battalion fought hard to stop the attack. After six hours of hand-to-hand -hand fighting, brave scenes were made. Corporal John A. Spatzafero, who was hurt, kept firing until he killed the Japanese soldier who shot him. He then fell down next to Lieutenant Edgar C. Green, who was also hurt and leading his platoon. Since they couldn't reach the rest of the Marines, they lay as still as they could to fool the Japanese that were coming from all sides. They heard four enemy troops coming up behind them, but their eyes were closed and hearts were racing. One person walked up to Green, took off his watch, and then looked through Green's jacket pocket for anything important. The Japanese pulled his hand back out quickly when he felt something sticky. Green's blood. He then ran off to clean it off. While in Japanese land, Green and Spots of Pharaoh did nothing for a whole day until the Marine line reached them again and they could be taken away. Military veterans were shocked by how badly the battle was. Private Dean Klingenhagen was hit hard by rocket and machine gun fire and heard an explosion behind him. He turned around and saw that his company leader had been hit directly by a mortar shell. His body was so badly burned that it was hard to tell who it was. In a moment, another Marine crawled by Klingenhagen with his right foot blown off moaning in pain. It took 10 hours of fighting for the Americans to stop the Japanese assault. Marines threw so many hand grenades at the enemy that Hand Grenade Ridge was named after the area where they fought. Jack Castagnola, a corporal, worked like a machine. He pulled the pin off of one grenade, rolled it down on the enemy, and then reached for another. As a high school football coach, Castagnola also killed a huge enemy soldier who would have made a good end on any football team. The Japanese soldier, who was over six feet tall and weighed more than 200 pounds, walked near Marine lines while wearing a Marine uniform to hide his identity. At first, Castagnola didn't pay much attention to the man until he saw his long gun and strange helmet, which made him realize that the man was Japanese. The first time Castagnola shot him, he sagged like a loose rope. The 22nd Regiment lost 60% of its soldiers in three days of fighting. Its 2nd Battalion lost more than 400 men, 
so the 3rd Battalion had to be sent in to take its place. Even though there was a lot of death, the Marines held their ground through heavy gun and mortar fire on May 15th and 16th. At 8.30 a.m. on May 16th, the Marines started their attack on Sugarloaf all over again. This was the fifth day in a row of ups and downs in battle. The 22nd Regiment worked on Sugarloaf while the 29th Regiment halfway climbed Half Moon. A battalion of Marines moved around Sugarloaf's left side late in the afternoon with the help of cover fire from the 29th. They wanted to rush up the hills, but they were met with heavy enemy fire, including artillery from Shuri Heights that hit them in the back and on the left flank. There were four times when Marines rushed to reach the top of Sugarloaf. They pulled away four times in a row. Elvis Lane, a combat reporter, saw how bad things were at Sugarloaf and wrote, Corpses litter the gray, muddy landscape. A lot of arms and legs have been cut off, and sometimes a head. I want to know how many other people are trying not to look at the dead. It looks like some of the bodies are grinning. The skull's skin is broken down, and the teeth are open. If I look, I'm afraid that one of these smiling dead will ask, Don't you belong with us? Someone else might say something terrible, like, The war isn't over. You'll be with us soon. The next morning, the horrible drill up the slopes, back down the slopes, with more marine bodies lying all over the ground, kept going, but this time Ushijima's defenders finally showed a clear weakness. A heavy battleship bombardment and airstrikes from carriers worked well together. Then, Major General Lemuel C. Shepard, leader of the 6th Division, led the 29th Regiment through a small depression running east of Sugarloaf. Once everyone was safe, the regiment split into two groups and struck Sugarloaf and Half Moon. One group rushed up the eastern slope of Sugarloaf and made it to the top, but a fierce counterattack threw the Marines back down the hill. As the fighting got rough, Captain Alan Meissner, who was in charge of the company, told his men to fix their bayonets and bring them back to the top. But he also had to pull back because of the fighting. After a third failed try, the Marines finally made it to the top late in the afternoon and successfully fought off an attack. They dug in to hold the crest, but the Marines ran out of ammo, which was a cruel turn of events. The Marines had to give up the crest again after 160 people were killed. On the plus side, a battalion took over a big part of Half Moon Hill. This meant that Marines would have more fire support for their try the next day. General Shepard saw a chance to end the bad things going on at Sugarloaf. Sugarloaf is finally taken. On May 18th, a clever trick worked perfectly. To keep enemy machine gun and rocket fire off of Sugarloaf, Captain Howard L. Maybe, who was in charge of D Company, 29th Regiment, sent a group of Marines against Half Moon and Horseshoe. While the Japanese fired on this group, Tanks backed up a second group of Marines who attacked Sugarloaf's right side. As the Japanese defenders sent more men to that area, maybe sent a third group of men and tanks around the left side to the back of Sugarloaf. He then sent 80 men led by First Lieutenant Francis X. Smith up the forward slope. When Smith and his men got to the top, they shot grenades at the Japanese from above while maybe's tanks fired straight down at them. Ushijima's defenders had to either give up and run through the Marines, which was almost suicide, or they had to rush the Americans with Banzai attacks. One group quickly ran out of a cave with explosives on their backs, but Marine machine gun bullets set off the satchel charges, and the group was gone in an instant. At the same time, Marines shot down Japanese soldiers who were running away without stopping. The Japanese began running down from the crest. Lieutenant Donald R. Pino saw. There had to be 150 of them. We fired them and blew them all over the place. Those acts put an end to the fight for Sugarloaf. After days of chaos, there was finally peace. Marines who were tired kept a close watch, but after seven frustrating days, the scarred Churn Mountain was theirs. The 6th Division Marines lost 2,662 men while fighting over what at first glance looked like a peaceful pile of dirt and rocks. 
they lost another 1,289 men who had to be removed because they were too tired or too tired from fighting. The Marines held on to Sugarloaf the whole time, even though Ushijima kept bothering them until both Horseshoe and Half Moon Hills were safe. What Reporter Lane did showed how privates, captains, corporals, and majors felt now that the week-long bloodbath was over. Lane believed that the battle on Sugar Loaf must be the bloodiest victory in the history of the Corps. Thank God there are no signs at all that the enemy is sending more troops to try to take back this hill. I've lost track of how many days we've been here and how many times we and they took Sugarloaf. We're sure that Sugarloaf really does belong on the 29th because of the silence. 